Dude, check it out. The content discussed in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. While we strive to provide accurate and up-to-date information, the topics covered may be controversial and opinions expressed are those of the speakers. It is important to consult with a qualified healthcare professional regarding any medical concerns or decisions. Listener discretion is advised. Like, think how crazy the French were. We're going to have a new calendar. We're going to have a new, <laughs> we're going to have a new measuring system. We now know the how to manage humanity. Uh, and then they, then they got put on the guillotine and then the guys that put them on the guillotine and they got on the guillotine. It was just ridiculous. It was just violence, violence, violence. And it's all envy at its core. Jim Brewer. Jim Brewer. Jim Brewer. Jim Brewer. Jim Brewer. And this is Jim Brewer. Um, hey Mike, how are you? You're home. Good, you're dude. Safe. Hey. We yeah, just had man. a big road trip. Yeah, your 40th birthday. For those of you who don't know, the back of Mike's head is now 40 years old. That's a 40 year old back of the head look right there. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you very much. It was a it was a fantastic weekend. It was a great celebration. I appreciate the cake and. As always, man, I always appreciate you taking me on the road and stuff. It was a fantastic trip. Yeah, it was good. We got a lot of stuff. We got to, um, you got to meet the Maria's crew that I always talk about, the coffee shop of community back yeah. in Chester, New Jersey. Um, we did a lot of stuff. You Dude, missed even uh, some of the uh, Jefferson Ave kids I got to meet. Oh, cool. yeah, that's right. You met Phil from yep. Jefferson Avenue. You met Crazy Gene. I shouldn't say crazy. I mean, he's not crazy. He's just funny. <laughs> you met. Oh, this is this is a big one. I don't know if you you met him, but my friend Scott Scott McGinnis, he was there. For those of you who know the story about the paint, the long live paint story. So I'm going to tell you about um, my first job that I ever had. And this is when I knew I wanted to do stand-up comedy. And I, and I, you know, like my my daughter's 16 now, and she's not really sure what she wants. I knew from the time I was 16, I wanted to uh, act, be funny, and do stand-up. And um, so I got a job. My friend hooked me up, and I worked in a uh, Sears paint department in Long Island. And uh, I ruined a lot of homes. <laughs> Just destroyed homes from 1985 to 88. If you go to Long Island now, you just see just crap jobs of a house. He came to the show and he was at Sears when I made that phone call and was part of who had to be uh, taken out of Sears. Yeah, part of the evacuation of my Muammar Gaddafi Sears bomb threat, which. I never knew it would turn into a bit and everything else. Matter of fact, I have I it recorded telling... when you were talking to him. I'll roll it sometime. Oh, now. you. Oh, you. Do... Oh, that's right. Dude, you post. filmed yeah. it. Sears. <laughs> Long live paint. He was. Were you there? Scott from Toys. I know, but were you at the event when I actually called? Uh huh. <laughs> 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 <But> the best. <laughs> The best was they'd have a Cabbage Patch doll day and they didn't expect that many people coming in from another neighborhood for Cabbage Patch dolls and those were not good days for Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming at him, what you mean you ain't got no more of these Cabbage Patch dolls? They would take the box. They would take the box. Right off of our hands. Right. And then I would call him <laughs> from the paint department because I could see him, and he's got to answer the phone. He has no choice. And I'd, I'd be like, can you go in the back and look for a Wilson basketball? Or like, <laughs> <laughs> I would have drive them crazy. It was so much fun. <laughs> what was your favorite part of the trip, Mike? Having your what, girl this weekend? meet you? Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, it was everything, man. It was the whole weekend was great. And then, yeah, having Heather meet us there Friday and then even just going out at night what 1230 at night at that bar in Long Island. That was awesome. Good food. Oh, the first night. Yeah. 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 Because we got in so late. We flew from the West Coast. We got in super late. Got in like 11 o'clock. Got to Huntington, New York, probably about 1230. We were there, right? It was pretty late. Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Yeah, you know, it was a good time. time, man. The whole weekend was great. It really was. And the Paramount was explosive as usual. That was, and I'm glad you were there, and I'm glad we filmed it. We had a lot of, uh, it was a lot of moments. And an 11-year-old, wasn't that where the 11-year-old kid was? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. And I didn't <laughs> see him until the end of the show, and then I started, I started rifling through my set, like, oh, my God, what? Did I say anything? Or his dad be like, I wish he didn't say that, but it all turned out good. So some Dude, great and it was your it was your 40th show there. Oh yeah. That's right. For the uh, yeah. And they made me this cool little uh baseball triangle thing. Thanks, Jim, for hitting 40 shows. Out of the park, looking forward to my wow. That's real. I was trying to figure out how many would be here. Wow. So holy crow, that's freaking awesome. So of course you know I can ship anything. Yeah, I need that ship. That's what I always say to him. Oh my god, I gotta keep those animals away from it too. That's no. amazing. So we were thinking, what? what you know, no, this we, is brilliant. We've done so many like weird things for him. It's like yeah. You know, I usually in my garage, you know, all the bats, yeah, with the, the bricks, bat. they steal my bricks. Yeah. They're already harassing me for a brick tonight. It's, it's coming. I got it's a huge coming. group here tonight. They're very good. The, I love the Paramount. I, I love performing at the Paramount. It's definitely my favorite venue in the whole, in the whole country, in the world. I love going. To, yeah. So those guys took care of me and I didn't know it was the 40th time that I played the Paramount Huntington, New York. It's pretty incredible. One of the things I love doing on the tour is we bring Mike, the sound guy, and he films everything. And I invite you to check that out on the Patreon page. It's almost like documentary, offstage, hangouts, in the car, at the venues, at the theaters. It's really cool, and I hope you check it out on Patreon. It is Driving with Brew. We do all different things on the Patreon. And here's the thing with the Patreon. You can sign up just for one month and then quit at the end of the month. That's my mentality. Check it out now on Patreon, Driving with Brew. Okay. Um, I told you I was super excited. I've been on his show multiple times. I told you how I used to listen all the time and a billion of you. But... You should know he is, if you don't know what Dr. Drew is doing and you lived in a closet your whole life. Um, he's the host of Ask Dr. Drew. It's a live stream. It's on Rumble. It's on YouTube. It's on Twitter. You go to drdrew.com and chief patient officer at the wellness company and one of my favorite human beings in the world, Dr. Drew. So you have... I got a couple questions to ask you All right. through your lifetime, because you also you're a healer at the end of the day. Mm. I mean, not just a doctor, but a healer. When, what was the, what was the first moment in your life where you said, this is what I have to do in my lifetime? What, what? Oh, it's, that's interesting. Um, hang on. <laughs> I got to spit out some giraffe poop first. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever can you believe that this guy he he really no yeah i, I in a zone where uh parasites are the leading cause of death and injury i suggest you do not eat poop or groundwater of any type. yeah no so i just, didn't just just for the record just, just so you know i wasn't having it nor was i having the game where they spit out the giraffe i'm like i'm not i'm not playing the game i appreciate it but it's i'm not hysterical. playing so I um, grew up, my father was a family practitioner and my uncle was a psychiatrist. And uh, it was sort of like, I always like, oh, I'm going to do what dad does kind of thing. And then I went out to college and I was at my first, I did well, but I was just like, I'm not up for this. I, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's I, these people are brilliant. I can't compete. Yeah. It's impossible. I, I, 
I was depressed. And it's a great, it was a great case in point about the male brain. I was, I was 17 when I went off to college Whoa. and, uh, and my brain was not ready. <laughs> it was not, not hardened enough to be able to deal with seven hours a night of homework, uh, seven days a week. And just, I just couldn't deal. Yeah. And, um, and I went about my business, did other things. And I, I thought I was going to be an opera singer for three minutes, which was insane. Yeah. yeah. Where, where, uh, where, how, where yeah. does that come from? I, you know, I could sing and you very quickly get bored yeah, with uh, other, th you, get, you yeah. get bored with the, the, you know, the American songbook <laughs> and you immediately go there. Also my, also, my mother was an opera singer, although I hated opera growing up. So weird. Um, now for the, but I got into for it. For the record, I didn't understand hmm. opera until I got older. And I didn't understand how people could sit and watch and cry. Hmm. Now I get it. I, I, I think I, I forgot who turned me on to a certain opera. And I was like, oh, my God. It's, it's the music. It's like an emotional, emotional, that's very right. powerful. That's right. hits something in you. Sorry. That, that's right. Okay. It's, so you, It's the music. And if you really understand the music and you perform the music, it really gets extra super powerful. Yeah. But you're officially old, Jim. You're yelling about the kids. You're out your lawn. You're yelling <laughs> about the kids. Now you're the fine. And now you're into opera. It, it's on now. You're, you're I know. But, I know. But uh, – but so, so I was, I got very unhappy. I got very depressed. I started having panic attacks and, and I started like, I really was miserable. And I, but I, but I was like that, I would not consider going back to the sciences until one day I did. And as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, that, maybe that would be a direction. And I sort of turned that way in and had to really get my shit together. I had to get it going fast. Yeah. And sort of went in at full force and A, loved it. B, found that I could handle it now. Mm. C, that I felt very purposeful and directed at what I was doing. And when I got to medical school, I loved it. I remember going out on the, uh, I'd park on this parking structure every day and I'd go out after anatomy lab and I'd just go, be like late at night and I'd just go, oh, I'm just so, so grateful to be doing this. It's so important. And that was kind of a theme that stayed with me. When I got into really the heavy duty training, I just thought what we were doing was so, so important. Yeah. And I think we have lost track of that a little bit in my profession. We've got all kinds of other things we think are important other than the care of the patient and the science of medicine. And uh, it really is disturbing to somebody like me. So, yeah, uh, there it is. I, I can see that, too. And I remember just as a little boy, um, my mom had a doctor and Dr. Persico. And I actually loved going to see him because I, I, I don't mm. know if there was a time where the, the, the doctor was he knew everything about you. He, did, he took time mm. to ask him any quite. But, and yeah. it was a, it was a family yeah. thing and he wasn't pushing anything. It wasn't pushing anything. That, that's that's the way I. That's how I've done it. I, you know, I, I went off into the psychiatric thing, doing all that stuff uh, while I was doing general medicine. I was doing intensive care medicine, but I always prioritize care. I thought that was the key thing that we needed to pay attention to. That is one of the lowest priorities it seems like these days. Yeah, and and I've kept practicing. I mean, I. You know, I see patients now regularly that I've seen for 20, 30 years mm. and, you know, their problem is they're as long as your arm. And I, and I like taking care of sick people. So which that's good. But I just spend time with them. I just, you know, I, I just do it a certain way. And that's how I've always done it. When you started taking care of, of addicts or trying to show the addict mm. how to, what was that? Do you remember your first, uh, either yeah. first human being and was it successful? Because there, I have a question so, about that. That's why. Okay. So how that happened was when I was a resident, I started moonlighting in a psychiatric hospital. I, I, one of the things I got into in my undergraduate training was neuroscience. And so I was always interested in the brain. I was always interested in neuroscience. And I always had kind of a affinity for psychiatry. And so I, I went to this, I worked a couple nights a week in this psychiatric hospital. Yeah. As time went on, I ended up becoming their chief of medical services. So I was rendering, I was doing, became an expert really in the medical care of the psychiatric patient. And we're seeing 20, 30 patients a day there. Also 20, 30 patients a day at my practice and in the medical hospital. It was craziness. Um, but a lot of the medical problems, particularly when I'd stay on call overnight at the hospital, 
guess what? We're on the drug unit. Mm. That's where all the medical stuff was. And, and I, I would find myself hanging out down there. I like the culture. I like the staff. It was just different than the rest of the psych hospital. And I still, the whole time, I became very good at detoxing people. I, I can detox somebody off anything. That's why this, this weird focus on detox these days is just astonishing to me. It's, it's so easy to get people off things if you know what you're doing. Mm. And, um, and I used to sit in the nursing station and look through the window into the treatment room where they had 12 steps on the wall, you know, the 12 steps. And, and I would just go, what is that goofy stuff in there? I, I'm doing them. I'm the medical man. <laughs> right. I'm getting them. Right. Right. They do that stupid stuff in there. And slowly I started kind of listening to what they were doing. And then I saw two women, young women, go from dying to amazing. Like, like they, they sort of wanted me to, I actually wouldn't follow patients all the way through their care. I would just sort of get them. That was back in the days when everybody stayed 28 days. And I would just get them through the detox and then I'd go on to the next patient. Right. But these two, I ended up following through their care. And I was, and it was just like, at the end, they were like, and one was like a methadone heroin. And, and, and I was like, oh my goodness, what happened here? What is this? Right. These people are going from dying to better than they ever knew they could be. I need to learn more about that. In medicine, you go from dying to chronically ill. This was dying <laughs> to right. better than ever. And I was like, I, I need to know more about this. And so I got in and uh, was really paying, you know, really uh, systematically educating myself. And the director at the time of the unit called me one day and he goes, Hey man, you know, you're there a lot. So how about you be the assistant director? Just, you just cover me on holidays and stuff. It's no big deal. There's, there's not much to it other than what you're already doing. Just, you know, Christmas, you'll have to be available and blah, blah, blah. I said, fine. Three months later or six months later or something, he quit. So I, that moved me into the position of director. Oh, wow. And I'm an internist. At that point, only psychiatrists did that job. So it was a very weird thing. Wow. And I thought, boy, I'm never going to have this opportunity again. I better, I better really grab it yeah. and get good at this, which I did. And I did ended up doing it for like 25 years. Wow. So yeah. did you notice that I, I noticed with, with a lot of addicts that I've known or whatever, mm -hmm. Is the key element not only just detoxing, but once they're detoxed, is the common thread a higher? Uh, you find a purpose in your life. Yeah. So, and, so and it's complicated, right? I mean, their brains are not normal for like a year, and you have to, you have to, depending on what the drug was, you know, and how long, and that kind of thing, you have to help them biologically with all of that. Right. right? So the idea is, how do you make recovery? possible right and because when your brain is not working right it's not possible so you get that piece under control then you get them in a community and a process and an accountability and the it, probably the number one ingredient at the beginning is rigorous honesty which is something they are not used to right they're getting by by lying all the time right. so rigorous honesty becomes number one thing then after that becomes being able to be close to another human being and the reason these people have so much difficulty with, at least in my world, where if you're if you're sick enough that you needed to see me, you had childhood trauma. Yeah. And childhood trauma makes other relationships very ch difficult, squirrely, painful, unpleasant. And you have to rebuild your emotional regulation system. Right. And part key in that is closeness with particularly one person, we call that person the sponsor, but at least one person, close exchange. And all the 12 step is, is a guided relationship with the sponsor yeah. and a couple of sort of um, guidelines that are necessary for everybody, frankly, but right. addicts really it's on full display. So A, stop controlling everything, stop it, let go, right? right. Stop controlling. And humans are particularly addicts. They won't let go unless they have something else to kind of look, lean on. And that something else is the higher power. Mm. So they need to get, get up to that, whatever they, their concept of that sure. is. Uh, and then they get in the, the relationship part. And then the fourth and the fifth step is about, you know, talking about shame and guilt and all the horrible things you did. And the drug addict in recovery across from you says, yeah, no kidding. I did the same thing. Wow. I get it. Uh, and then the spiritual piece kicks in right around then. Right. So right around then, they, they, they start, they'll start feeling like something's not right. I feel empty. I, there's something I've been trying to fill with my drugs. I can kind of can kind of see it now. Yep. 
And that's where meaning and spirituality and even identity starts to come into the mix. It's much more complicated at that point. Right. No, it's 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 fascinating. I I I tried going to um in New Jersey where I lived for a while in the next town, they had a big heroin, you know, mm-hmm. they'd have a school there and try to get them all back. And I got involved and I'm not even a doctor. And you're not? <laughs> and, what am I doing? And here? I thought all this time. Dude, yeah. Are you, and I was I thought, like I thought Goldboard had some medical <laughs> basis for it. <laughs> and I was pretty convinced I could turn around some of these teenagers. I was so convinced of that. Like when I get my personality uh, yeah. on. Yeah, them, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That was I remember this one particular boy. He was actually, I think he was a he was like a Hasidic Jewish kid and he mm-hmm. kind of went off the, and they, you know, they pushed him out, whatever their culture and the culture pushed him out yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And he yeah. became a heroin. And I got so close with this kid and I started bringing him to like the ball games and him and a couple of friends. And then, you know, I did some road trips and came back I'm like, Hey, where's, where's Henry? Oh, he, yeah, he's what I was, I was, I was devastated. I sobbed for two straight days oh, and I just couldn't, absolutely. but that's why it's, that's what people understand. Someone in your line, you have to, you have to emotionally almost not get too attached and know. Well, you have to, you have to, you're, you're describing codependency and that's why I'm laughing. And I was very much that way at the beginning. How too, can you right? not be? Before. How can you not be? Well, I went to therapy for a long time, Jim. Right, you, right, you, right. You, right. right. <laughs> so, but uh, that helped me really clarify boundaries. And, and that's what it is. I, I thought oh, I had this special appreciation of their trauma and I could rest, save them and fight them. Uh, it's all bullshit. And here's what the, <laughs> right. here's what the addict here, Here's what the addict see. This guy's going to give me drugs. <laughs> that's what the addict sees, period, end. And so I, you know, I learned early to always keep my recovering professionals and peers around yeah. me. I never went in a room alone without with a patient. Mm. I always at least had my nerves to kick the back of my chair if I started going the codependent direction. And uh, it, you know, you know, Bob Forrest, the guy who did celebrity rehab with the glasses yeah. and the hat. Yeah. He he would. I remember one. I really he just keep me so humble. There was one time we had this patient that came in several times and. Uh, I spent a long session with her because I knew her very well. And I, and I went, uh, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I came out and I go, oh, she, for the first time, talked about this traumatic relationship with her mother. And I, I really think she's, like, she's making progress. He, Bob looks at me and she goes, yeah, she wants drugs. <laughs> she sees you. She, she knew you're going to prescribe for her if she gets upset <laughs> enough. And she, her drugs. And that's it. she just wants her drugs. I was like, what? What? How dare you? I was all upset. <laughs> and then the other one. You just, you don't, you're, you, when you're not an addict, your brain doesn't work that no. way. So you have to have an addict around you yeah. because the, the using of the drug is always the priority. You can't forget that. Even when the, and the patients don't know it, it's all on a deep motivational drive level. So everything else the patient is doing is serving that distorted motivation at the bottom of their brain. Wow. Yeah, it's that's that's mind, but it, doesn't it, does it baffle your mind how much of our country is mm. addicted a to something mm. or it, addicted to what even you say which is i think could be just as dangerous as control trying to control everything which you may not and there you go you may not be a drug addict but you're trying to yeah. control things is really dangerous it's so really yes destructive we we are Yes, we are. We we have so much stuff going on as a country. I mean, you know, the childhood trauma of the 60s, 70s and 80s are coming to bear now. And so there's all this narcissism. And when people are narcissistic, they have envy and rage. And when they have envy and rage, they form, form mobs and then they scapegoat cancellation. And that's what's going on right now. So what do you think? All all that- even stop that. What do you think that is? Because I mean, you said parenting. 70s, 70s, 80s, and and this newer yeah. mob where they get upset yeah. and they're finding where they fit in. What, what in your mind you're like? Oh, you know what that's from? 
That's from X Y Z. The seventies. I, I watched it. I watched it happen in real time. I remember, I was on the radio every night right. talking to these kids as they hit their adolescence. They were sexually abused. They were physically abused. They were neglected. And the, it, that went on for like 20 years. And then the parents are drug addicted and the families are broken up. That is what's called a narcissistic injury. Mm. And that creates narcissistic personality disorders. And I saw it happen also at the psychiatric hospital. There, there is a admission sheets where they put the primary diagnosis, but they also would put the personality diagnosis in there. And when I first got there in 1984, 85, there was all kinds of different personality disorders on the second left in the second row. About 1988, 90, I noticed a lot of borderline disorders coming in, just mostly borderline. And then by 92, 94, only cluster B. We never saw anything but cluster B, which are the narcissistic disorders. It was clear to me that something was really different. And the only period of history I could find that was similar in terms of that kind of trend was pre-revolutionary France. So wow. I wrote a book about, yeah, I wrote a book about narcissism and I wanted to put a chapter in, I'll never forgive myself for not insisting upon it, about this observation. And I said, I don't know what I'm saying, except that there's going to be scapegoating. I know it. Envy, rage, it's, it's going to get acted out somehow and there will be scapegoating. And uh, I didn't do it, mm. uh, but now here we are. Wow. And I would urge everyone to study your history because we do not want to do what uh, pre-revolutionary Russia did and pre-revolutionary France, we do not want to do this. Trust me. And what is that exactly? Uh, uh, form mobs and get radicalized and but decide that we now know the truth and we're going to, uh, we, we know what's right for humanity and we're gonna, we're, like, think how crazy the French were. We're gonna have a new calendar. We're gonna have a new, <laughs> we're gonna have a new, new measuring system. We now know the, how to manage humanity. Uh, and then they then they got put on the guillotine, and then the guys that put them on the guillotine, they got on the guillotine. It was just ridiculous. It was just violence, 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 and it's all envy at its core. I think we're. I wouldn't say we're there, but I will say I. It's funny because when we worry about it, I, oh, we worry about I think it. it's the first time in my life, the last couple of years where I'm literally going, where do we move to outside this country? Mm -hmm. What other, what other, You've never had that, discussion never in had that before. discussion in my life. And it's the first time, like, we're not doing it the way. And I, what, what, what freaked me out too, is just the amount of people that uh, either support it or get involved with it. And like, even this, you know, I was talking about this show called the van life. It's all the same Something happened to this person in a van. They're off to the run. Something happened here. They're off and running. It's it's all the madness of it all. But do you see um, a huge change coming, whether it's in the medical world? Because I feel maybe it's just with someone I most people I talk with now that the medical industry is no longer trusted. Like they're. They're, they're not trusted. I, I don't trust them. That's why, listen, that's why I'm working with these guys. I, I want to give it back to the patients. I'm, I've been spending my whole career defending the patient-physician relationship. It's over. it's over. We lost. It's over, yeah. We, we, got to, we got to give everything to the patients. I mean, I'm, I'm building these kits that people can get with little online visits, you know, with telemedicine, things that they know how to use, they've heard of before, they've taken before, and they should just have access to these things. And it should be cheap and inexpensive and readily available. And, you know, things should, with education and with telehealth bath, backup, it's so easy. It's so easy. And it doesn't, you don't have to go to a $1,500 urgent care visit or wait three weeks for a doctor visit. It's, 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 it, we, it, it, the good news is that these kinds of trends that have been awful create opportunities and creative people who want to solve problems will hopefully make things a little better. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. You know, you know, it was a big eye opener for me. And you know, some people hate this guy. Um, what did you think of whether you hate him or like him? It doesn't matter. It was the, the documentary sicko. Did you see sicko mm -hmm. by Michael Moore? I did not, okay. but I believe I heard about so it. So what he, yeah. what, what blew my mind in that was, and again, I, I don't know the guy from a hole in the wall. 
No. I, I know people went after him, whatever. But during there, he went to Cuba. He went to other countries where yeah. it seemed all those countries, the drugs were extremely cheap. And a lot of times we were importing it. And mm -hmm. what was more mind boggling was the doctors weren't millionaires, billionaires. They weren't the ones living on, they were amongst the people in, in pretty much everywhere they went. They didn't see themselves, Hey, I'm this, so I make a billion dollars. And then, you know, and then he showed how Congress and everything else is all big pharma and they pay them. And this guy yeah. gets quarter yeah. million dollar. This guy gets half a billion dollars. This guy gets $2 million and blah, blah, blah. And that, that was a long time ago, and that yeah. that was. And, and by the way, yeah. and don't don't worry about the physicians making a, making a lot of money. That's over. Also, uh, they get firemen, teacher times of salaries without any time off, and with the privilege of working eighty hours a week. Right. So th that's done. unless right. unless talk about how screwed up our system is. Uh, unless you are a plastic surgeon mm. or you're doing something that is a cash and carry, not associated with the insurance company and being an employee and all that stuff, which ever, all doctors are now. They're all Everybody employees. Is. They're all part of right. they, but the guys that step out and take cash and carry, they don't make three times what I make. They don't make 10 times what I make. They often make a thousand times what I make per unit time spent and per effort. So it's, and a hundred times more is common, mm. typical. It's it's bizarre. that tells you something about the priorities we have in this country, doesn't I it? I know it's a little scary. So, I got some. Uh, I want to ask you about certain drugs. Um, okay. Do you know much about fenbendazole? I mean, I know it's. I, I've used it over the years. What'd you for, use it for? You know. Lipid lowering, if I remember right, it's we, but it never really worked. I think it's for triglyceride lowering. If I, I have to look it up, let me double, double check. I'm thinking of the right drug. Um, but I, you're, you're looking for longevity stuff, right? Well, no, That's no, no. It, what, what blows my mind is like, for instance, and again, I, I first I saw a, a friend of my. Long story short, I would have coffee with this a friend of mine, and his friend was dying of cancer, and he had stage mm. four, and he went into um, hospice, and. He tried to tell me, oh, he started taking, you know, his fenbendazole or whatever it was. I, I, I was wrong. I was thinking about something else. This, this is a this is a relative of ivermectin, frankly. Yes. And, and, yes. And both ivermectin and this drug have been thought of as something that could be used for anti-cancer. I have a friend who's a very well-known ER doctor who has breast cancer and she is doing something like this for her cancer. Right. And I, so I, I know someone as well. And so this guy was, I, I had him on the show and he told me, I, I don't have an opinion. I, here's, here's my basic. You don't position. know enough about right, me too. It. Yeah. But here's what I, I'll, I will go to the full mat to preserve patients right to do what they want to do with their doctor. I, this is one of the things that blew my mind during the COVID yeah not insane many things blew my mind but one of them was when people went after joe rogan's doctor oh my for god yeah and and this 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 exposed to me the insanity of this because they went after him because he prescribed some ivermectin i i'm not a huge ivermectin i've seen it work with antivirus i, I mean whatever yeah. people people and their doctors want to try that good it's harmless i've used ivermectin a shit ton we we used to work I used to work at a county hospital during the El Salvadorian Civil War, and we had a huge increase in uh, or influx of uh, Central Americans. A lot of worms, a lot of uh, a lot of ivermectin was prescribed back then. Uh, but in any event, the the um, what was that? Rogan and, and oh yeah, so the ivermectin and Rogan and and but the, the but the thing they should if they want to be outraged by something outlying that this guy did. He gave him two NAD infusions. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Mm. I did that. I asked Joey, would that help? That's interesting. He said, yeah, it helped me. I was like, that's amazing. Somebody needs to study that. Good for your doctor. So, I, I, why should, why, why, and by the way, talk about narcissism, why anybody feels they have a right to an opinion about what anybody's doctor doing with anybody, that's disgusting. That is disgusting to me. It's none of your effing business. I, I, 
Dr. Drew, I'll never forget during that time I had, uh, you know, and I got it. I got the COVID and I had an infectious disease doctor. I, I, mm -hmm. I, that's all I wanted was an infectious disease doctor. I travel a lot. I get infected, you know, I have a nasal infection. He was insistent, insistent, insistent on only one way to get rid of it. You know, make sure you get the, the shot. And I would ask all these questions. He didn't want to hear about it, blah, blah, blah. And it blew my mind, even a guy like that that knew. But to bring up what you're talking about, the I, I still say, and I'll have, I'll get into it with someone. I don't do it anymore. That moment on Rogan, f f to me, changed the entire world you're either mm -hmm. you're either here open-minded and you want to explore and let's look into this door he just cracked open or you are always going to just believe whatever the man in the white coat says on the television because it's labeled mm -hmm. and it's edited and it looks so pretty and that's going to be your god for the rest of your life i mean mm -hmm. I, to me that was the most common sense if i I, I always say, if I came to you, Dr. Drew, and you said, Jim, the only way you can help your hair not falling out is by sticking needles in you. And I go, yeah. well, I'm not going to deny that, but I'm just telling you, I took a bath and I ate this chocolate and <laughs> I don't know which one. And also my hair's growing back. Why would you not at least stop and listen and go, huh, that's interesting. Should we try this? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing, Jim, is that the, when I was in training, the, 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 the how should I prescribe, the, describe this? The, the most important priority was the in, impression clinically of the physicians and the experts. The literature, the medical literature caught up with oftentimes the experts and the doctors and help confirm or question the clinical opinions of the doctors. So we have taken clinical opinion in the name of evidence-based medicine mm. and expunged it from the medical system. And that is at our peril. Mm. That is that is not good. That is not good. And and <sighs> So do you feel um, you're bumming me out, Jim? What's that? You're bumming me out. No, because what I say is, listen, I think we I think most of us are aware what happened, how it happened and what caused it without going yeah. into great detail. But what I do think is there's people like yourself, uh, you know, maybe a Dr. Malone and, and so many others that are now starting what I'll say a change. I won't say the revolution. I'll say the change yeah. of our life towards health, medicine, and everything is going to slowly begin to be the greater for mankind and period. As long as we learn from, uh, it's not about the money. Money's always, to, it's always the root to the pure evil, in my opinion. It's like, oh, follow the money. Follow the money. Now we yeah. under, rather than f the healing, we're going to follow that. It made a left turn because all the money you can make. Oh, um, but isn't it fascinating? So, so how do you start rebuilding the trust? I guess just time, I guess. Just in time. To time and we're going to have to be more. No, I, I think more improvisational with the medical system. Uh, uh, first of all, we have to have we have to restore dialogue. We have to, this idea that you, you can't talk to that person. That's that is also that is beyond disgusting. How else do we push things forward except by considering, debating? I mean, my God, that's what we were reared on. Correct. But yes, we have to have, we have, to have sp the ability to speak and, and share ideas and change things. And we have to start improvising in terms of how we take care of patients. And I, I, my sense is that, that, I mean, think about it, you, you know, the idea that you don't know how to use a, use azithromycin, a Z-Pack. Why do you need to, I mean, how much medical guidance do you need? <laughs> when, when, <laughs> right. You know I mean? Take four now, now, on Monday. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and there should be concern about the global biosphere as it pertains to these powerful antibiotics. And we should all share in that concern. 
but patients are smart and we've been living with these things and working with them for 50 years. Yeah. People know how to use them. People know what's up. Why do you, and most countries have these things over the counter, a lot of this stuff, they don't use prescriptions. I mean, why, why can't we be a little more like that? I, why do we have to have it so tight? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not saying that patients should be at their liberty to do whatever they want with themselves. It, there'll be bad things will happen, but properly guided with a little bit of education and backup. And I, this is, I think this may be the way we move forward. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, it was appalling that I get up. Well, and then, and then public health is just adulterated. Public health is, I know, I can't imagine. It was shocking what happened with the public health system. I, just shocking. I that, that's a complete mess. So that needs to be changed in some way legally. The laws have to get in on that. Yeah. that that That's a tough one, though, too, because the people that, put the laws out are paid, uh, we'll say influenced to. Well, we need to do something about that. We need to work. That's something we got to do something about. I know. Uh, what, yeah. do, what do we do? Do we start all over? I'm willing to start all over. I'm willing to forget this system. The two party system doesn't work. This entire Congress. But I'm ready for that. I'm, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm ready for like, all right, you know what? Reboot. Did We tried. We tried. We did our. We thought we can. Let's go back. To, what, what was the Constitution? Can we look hard at this again and try to figure this out? Nah, nah, nah. Um, and I get. I don't, I don't know where we're going. I don't even want to look at where we're going. I don't even want to. I, I don't want to look at this year. At all. Your history, man. I can tell you where the problems can. You know where it can go off the rail. We we just study history for that. Yes, I love how you brought up like. Um, we can, it'd be nice to be able to buy certain drugs at the, like I, I went to Costa Rica and yeah. I did start getting, I remember, and I bought it at the airport. I bought it at the local store. So, ivermectin. Like, yeah. And they looked at me like I was nuts. So I, okay. I took it, cleared up my COVID. Maybe it was something else. I'm just saying my daughter and I took it and in two days, I was like, oh my so, God. So here's, amazing. here's what happened with me. I had an interesting experience. I was traveling with Peter McCullough once. Yeah. One of the advocates Love for him. these medicines. Love him. And, and, and I, I'm not an enthusiast for these medicines. I, I will go to the mat to protect people's ability to use them. Yeah. If that's what they want to do with their doctor. But I'm, I just not seen it work. Right. right. And I used a lot of Paxlovid and it worked. It's expensive, but okay. But it worked. Um, and we were trying with a guy that got really sick and, uh, I thought, oh boy, here we go. We were in a foreign country and this guy's really sick. And, uh, and I immediately started thinking about protease inhibitors and all these fancy antiviral medicines. And Peter goes, no, 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 take this and this. And he did three things. I think ivermectin was one of them. And that dude was not just better by the afternoon. He was well. And it broke my brain. <laughs> it literally broke my brain. So that was when I started going, oh, I got to look into this a little more seriously because I'm, I was, I'm familiar with the, the uh, what we call in vitro data, in the laboratory data on the antiviral activity. It's very impressive, but I was never really impressed with the, the clinical use of it, but I need to pay attention. And that's what we should be doing as a doctor, paying attention to things. Maybe maybe it's nothing. Maybe that was a coincidence. I don't know. We'll find out. I know. Well, I I got to be honest with you. I think I'm excited about where we're at. I'm excited when I talk to other people. And Good. I, I, I've never heard so many people with cancer trying different things. I know, I know a friend mm -hmm. now that's going to, no, I don't know. I don't know him. My good friend, his buddy went paralyzed. We won't blame it on anything, but he, through circumstances, went to the bathroom, came back and couldn't walk. But he has to, he's oh doing stem cell search in, oh, in yeah. like Brazil. I mean, he's got to fly to mm -hmm. Brazil. And we had this conversation today. It'd be really nice what they're doing in these other countries that we so viciously foam at the mouth, don't open our minds and hearts to mm -hmm. start doing here. But I do think it's slowly happening. Um, and we'll, we'll, it, it is. Yeah. I just worry that people don't understand the risk they're taking sometimes. Uh, they, they may be pushing science forward, uh, but they may not be doing themselves a favor necessarily. And I, as long as they understand the risks, I, I again, I yes. will defend people's right yes. to do whatever they want to do. Yeah. And, 
I, you know, my patients have been doing funny things for a long time. Yeah. Most of it didn't work out so great. So I'm a little <laughs> jaded. By that. Right. Uh, and so, and, and I'm very familiar with the science and I'm a scientist. And so, but I'm not going to force something. I, somebody said to me the other day that the woman I told you about her, the breast cancer tape, taking out of her mattress, how could you let her do that? How can I let her do that? That is the most insane, disgusting sedation I've ever heard. Mm. Let her yeah. manage her own decisions about her own medical care. Yeah. Are you effing kidding yeah. me? So yeah, I, I don't know where we've been the last few years, but we got to come back from it. We it, will. It, okay. So I'm going on Gutfeld tonight, and one of the things they're bringing up, yeah, is the um, is the language police, and uh, you know, don't call the what guy that murdered that poor young nurse uh, an illegal oh. immigrant. And that's another. That's a bottom for me, man. That, that that's a bottom. That is disgusting. That is disgusting. That a woman's murder is a lower priority than making sure we manage that language. That's it. I see you. I'm f done. I'm f done with this. It's disgusting. So I'm, that's what I'm going to talk. I'm about. glad <laughs> you. I'm glad you see that. But I think we're at yeah. a stage in life where we have to understand we have been taken over. There's not. We're not in the middle of it. We've been taken over. And and as much as you allow the takeover, just like everywhere else in the world, and you said, oh, it can't happen here. When right in front of you, they tell you, hey, listen, it wasn't an illegal alien. It was an undot. You have now become the sick, demented, evil, soulless, perverted being. I'm not even going to put human in front of you. I'm going to say being because you have yeah. lost all track of humanity. And I know you got to rock and roll. Yeah. I appreciate your time. DrDrew.com. I could talk to you for hours and hours. I had a million things I wanted to say, but I. Well, I got I got to get you one of these wellness travel kits. I put the kit together myself. It's the stuff I give my patients when they travel. I would love that. And uh, if you're going to go to other countries, like the way, the way you've I been do. going. I don't think the draft poop's going to do it. So we, I got to get you one of these. Draft poops. <laughs> All right. It's official. Dr. Drew says no giraffe poop, even if you thought about I, it. I, I don't think so. All right. I didn't, I, look, I'm open to everything. We'll check it out. First time I've heard about it, but I'm guessing. No. Okay. Maybe I'll get the guide on. He'll explain it, and then you can talk to him how he did it. But anyway, I thank you. I'm blessed to have you on this earth to do the things you do, and so many others are as well. Thank you for giving me your time, Dr. Drew. All the best to you. Thank you. Thanks, man. You too, man. Dr. Drew, everyone, uh, drdrew.com. He's uh, still a chief patient officer at the wellness company, host of the Ask Dr. Drew. It's on live stream. You can check it out on Rumble, YouTube, Twitter. Um, yeah, I could talk to him for hours. Hopefully, we, uh, I want to see this pack he's talking about. I'm definitely going to pick his brain about that, and maybe I can get one of those or we'll send it. And then... Um, that would be funny if I got the uh, the tour guide from Africa who grew up in the Maasai tribe. Because the way he, I'm not going to lie to you, the way he explained to me, like the way the giraffe breaks down, he had me, well, I shouldn't say that. I think he, well, he had me intrigued. Had me intrigued. That's a, that's a fair enough word, Mike. That's a fair enough word. All right. Let's, uh, let's. Let's get ready for uh, another day. I want to thank you all. I know you don't realize it, but I have been away. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Drew, for coming on. Go to drdrew.com. Um, and um, we'll catch up soon. Thank you to all my Patreon fans, all the fans that came out with all the shows. I want to recap all that stuff. Vancouver and Eugene, Oregon, everywhere we went. Uh, Federal Way. It was uh, a great run. And of course, the Paramount, which I'll be back there in April. And hopefully, Rich Aronovich is better and he doesn't break his toe. He was supposed to be in the show and he wasn't on the show. But go to richesfunny.com, check him out, all that jazz. Mike, thank you for all you do. And we'll catch up soon. Thanks for hanging out in the Bruniverse. Jim Brewer, and I got my own Patreon page, and hopefully you'll check it out. Live comedy concert streamed once a month. Early access to the Bruniverse podcast every single week, 
and have bonus footage and bonus segments. I promise you I'm not going to let you down. Go check out my official Jim Brewer Patreon page, and I'll see you there. Six shots of espresso. Let's see where he is in an hour. He's going to be pushing the car. <laughs> <laughs> We lost Jim. Why? He's running to Eugene. So many ideas.